I like the story about the Baptist preacher of a large church in South Georgia. Unknown to most of the congregation, he enjoyed a few drinks, but his passion was for peach brandy. One of his congregants would make him a bottle each Christmas. One year, the pastor went to visit his friend, hoping for his usual Christmas present. His friend did give him a bottle, but told the pastor that he had to thank him for the peach brandy from the pulpit the next Sunday. Anxious to get the brandy, the pastor quickly agreed and left. So the next Sunday, the pastor suddenly remembered that he had to make a public announcement that he was being supplied alcohol by a member of the church. That morning, his friend sat in the church with a grin on his face, waiting to see the pastor's embarrassment. The preacher stepped up to the pulpit and said, before we begin, I have an announcement. I would very much like to thank my friend Joe for his kind gift of peaches and for the spirit in which they were given. The Grinch had stolen all the Christmas gifts from under the Who's Christmas trees, including the peach brandy. He had also taken the trees, the decorations, and all the food from Whoville. But the Who's still sang with joy on Christmas morning. Dr. Seuss writes, Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presents at all. That confused the Grinch. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. Then his heart grew three sizes. As a result, he quickly returned all the Christmas presents, Christmas trees, decorations, and all the food to the Who's in Whoville. How did the Who's respond? They welcomed him and made him the guest of honor, the one who carved the roast beef, beast at their celebration. The Grinch was transformed. He had hated Christmas. He was angry with the Who's because of all the noise they made. He stole everything related to Christmas from them, not because he wanted it. No, he was going to dump everything in the garbage. He stole everything to hurt them and bring sadness to them. But after his heart grew three sizes, he changed his mind and brought everything back that he had stolen. The Who's forgave him. Then the Grinch and the Who's feasted together. As Matt Rawl points out, this story is not only about the change in the Grinch, the story is also about forgiveness on the part of the Who's. They could have had the Grinch arrested, tried, and sentenced for his crimes. They could have demanded restitution. They might have even sought revenge. But when the Grinch returned everything, they welcomed him and included him in the celebration. The story of the birth of Jesus shows that if we respond to God's good news, we will find joy in the community of faith. In Luke's Gospel, the angel gave Mary the good news of her being the mother of the Savior. Mary responded in faith. She rejoiced in the privilege of, bear, of bearing God's Son. She sang the song we call the Magnificat. The angels told the shepherds the good news that the Savior had been born. They left their flocks, found the baby lying in a feeding trough of all places, just as the angel had told them. They rejoiced, glorifying God and singing praises to the Lord. In Jesus' parable of the loving father, the prodigal son repented of his foolishness and returned home. He hoped his father would forgive him for disrespecting him and squandering his wealth, and he hoped his father would hire him as a worker on the farm. When his father ran to meet him and the son apologized for hurting his father and losing his wealth, but his father welcomed him with open arms. He did not hire him as a worker. Instead, he welcomed him home as a son. He threw a party for his wayward boy. The son found love and joy in the arms of his father who forgave him. 
Responding to God's good news sometimes involves changing our minds and our behaviors, turning away from what we have been doing and turning to God. We will find joy because God is always willing to forgive us and welcome us home. The story of the Grinch is not a gospel story, but it has aspects of the good news in it. The Grinch repented of his meanness and returned the things he had stolen, and he was welcomed by the Who's. Christmas is about the good news of the coming of Emmanuel. That good news of the Savior's birth brings us joy as we respond to God's grace. Mary had faith and sang for joy that she would bear the Messiah. The shepherds believed, ran to the stable, and rejoiced when they found the baby. How do we respond to this good news of the birth of the Savior? It is probably different for each of us depending on where we are in our spiritual journeys. We may need to repent like the Apostle Paul, who had been persecuting Christians. When he saw Christ in a blinding light on the road to Damascus, Paul had to admit he had been wrong. Like the Grinch in the story, Paul had to stop being mean to people he did not agree with, people whose faith he misunderstood. He had to humble himself and learn about the Savior from those he had persecuted. I imagine it must have been difficult for the Christians in Antioch to accept Paul. He probably had arrested some of them and even had some of them tortured for their belief in Jesus as the Messiah. Perhaps some of them had lost loved ones in Paul's persecution. At first they were wary of the former persecutor, but the Christian community came to forgive him and accept him. Paul found joy in God's forgiveness and acceptance of him and in the Christian communities welcoming him. The good news of Christ eventually transformed him. He wrote to the Romans, I'm not ashamed of the good news. It is God's own power for salvation to all who have faith in God. Turning toward God and the good news of our Savior may involve turning away from bad habits, addictions, meanness, self-centeredness, gossip, and so on. It may mean we have to stop doing things we know are wrong. The good news is that God will always welcome us back. In fact, God's Spirit will help us make our way to God. God's grace and mercy are offered to all of us, and we also extend grace to each other. It's only by the grace of God that we can let go of what others have done to us. It's not easy. In Jesus' parable, the prodigal son was welcomed home by his father, but not by his older brother. His older brother hated him for what he had done to their father and how he had squandered half the farm's assets. He would not accept him back as a brother, even though his father pleaded with him to celebrate his brother's return. The good news of our Savior's birth means we are forgiven and welcomed by God into the family. In response, we are to forgive and welcome one another. We forgive one another as Christ forgives us. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. One four-year-old misunderstood that line. He prayed, and forgive us our trash baskets as we forgive those who put trash in our baskets. Forgiving others was central to the good news of Jesus Christ. After Jesus taught the model prayer to his disciples, he said, if you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your sins. What? Wait. If God does not forgive our sins, how can Jesus be our Savior? God's grace is offered to us in the coming of Christ. Once we receive the grace of God, it must also flow through us to others. Once we accept God's forgiveness, we offer that forgiveness to others. That is where the joy is. We cannot have joy when we're holding grudges against someone else. Clara Barton was the founder of the American Red Cross a friend of hers once reminded her of an especially cruel thing that had been done to her years before. 
but Barton seemed not to recall it. Don't you remember it? Her friend asked. No, Barton said, I distinctly remember forgetting it. You can't be free and happy if you hold grudges against people. So we learn to put them away and we get rid of them. The good news is that God always welcomes us. And there's more good news. The people in the community of faith welcome us. We forgive each other and accept one another. Is reminding ourselves of our responsibility to forgive each other putting too much pressure on us at Christmas? Is it unfair to expect reconciliation to happen with all the other stresses that come at this time of year? A woman and her grandmother were sitting on the porch discussing a member of the family. The grandmother was a very spiritual and gentle woman. He's just no good, the young woman said. He's completely untrustworthy, not to mention lazy. Yes, he's bad, the grandmother said as she rocked back and forth in her rocker. But Jesus still loves him. I'm not so sure about that, the younger woman persisted. Oh, yes, the elderly lady assured her. Jesus loves him. She rocked and thought for a few more minutes and then added, of course, Jesus doesn't know him like we do. This is a stressful time of year, and sometimes relationships are strained. A man was telling his friend about an argument he had with his wife. He commented, I hate it when we fight. Every time we have an argument, she gets historical. The friend replied, you mean hysterical? No, he insisted, I mean historical. Every time we argue, she drags up everything, everything from the past and holds it against me. It's certainly not easy to forgive. In fact, I believe forgiveness is not a natural human capacity. Our tendency is to want, to want revenge or to hold grudges. Our ability to forgive comes from God's grace working within us. It may be unfair for me to bring up forgiving one another when we may be at holiday parties or in family celebrations with people we really don't like, people we have difficulty forgiving for what they've done to us. But on the other hand, Advent and Christmas may be the best time to be reconciled to those who have rejected us or those who have been cruel to us. It's a perfect time to live into the grace of our Savior and forgive one another. And for some of us to be reconciled to those who have offended us would be a Christmas miracle. I realize it may take a long time, it may even take years for us to come face to face with what we need to change in our own lives. And it may also take a long time to come to forgive those who have hurt us. The good news is that the Holy Spirit is working in us and making us more aware of who we are and how we can become more like Christ. God is patient with us. We're all in this process of growing in grace. Jesus was born to be the savior of the world. That is good news of great joy. We can accept the gift of forgiveness that God offers. By God's grace, we can learn to accept and forgive ourselves and even to accept and forgive others. Thanks be to God. Amen.